Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation series with Elisa Massimino, our Drawing and Chair for Human Rights. Uh, my name is Melissa Stewart. I am the Dash Muse Teaching Fellow at the Human Rights Institute, and I'm joined with my faculty director, Professor Andy Schoenholtz, and we couldn't be more pleased to um, have you here for this conversation today. I'm going to introduce our speakers who are going to engage in a back and forth conversation for about um, 45 to 50 minutes today. And afterwards, we're going to be taking some questions from the audience. The way that you ask questions is through the Q&A feature that you see at the bottom of your screen. At any point, if you have a question, go ahead and type it into um, the square there. And at the end, when we're ready for questions, I'll be moderating that space. Um, so I'll go ahead and introduce our speakers. Uh, we're joined today by Elisa Massimino. Um, she is in her second year as our Robert F. Drynan SJ Chair in Human Rights. And she is also currently serving as a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress. Before coming to Georgetown, Professor Massimino was a senior fellow with the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government and a practitioner in residence at Georgetown's Walsh School of Foreign Service. Previously, Professor Massimino spent 27 years, the last decade as president and CEO at Human Rights First, one of the nation's leading human rights advocacy organizations. Professor Massimino has a distinguished record of human rights advocacy in Washington, DC. She has testified before Congress dozens of times, writes frequently for mainstream publications and specialized journals appears regularly in major media outlets, and speaks to audiences around the country. Professor Massimino is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and serves on the Board of Advisory Councils of human rights organizations, such as Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights and Refugees International. Join me in welcoming Professor Massimino. Great to be here. We'd also like to welcome Eric Ward, the Executive Director of Western States Center a nationally recognized expert on the relationship between authoritarian movements, hate violence, and preserving inclusive democracy, Eric brings over 30 years of leadership in community organizing and philanthropy to his roles as Western State Center's executive director and senior fellow with Southern Poverty Law Center and Race Forward. Since Eric took the helm in 2017, Western State Center has become a national hub for innovative responses to white nationalism, anti-Semitism, and structural inequality towards a world where everyone can live, love, work, and worship free from bigotry and fear. In his 30 plus year civil rights career, Eric has worked with community groups, government and business leaders, human rights advocates, and philanthropy as an organizer, director, program officer, consultant, and board member. Currently co-chair for the Proteus Fund, Eric is a member of the Pop Culture Collaborative's Pluralist Visionaries Program and the recipient of the Peabody Facebook Futures Media Award. Eric is in high demand as a speaker and media source and is the author of multiple written works created with key narrative shifts, including Skin in the Game, How Anti-Semitism Animates White Nationalism. He has been quoted in the New Yorker, New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Washington Post, ESPN, NPR, BBC, Rolling Stone, and numerous other media outlets, and regularly publishes on Medium and the Oregon Way blog. Eric is working on a forthcoming documentary about whiteness and race in America, and is an aspiring singer-songwriter under the name of Bulldog Shadow. Please join me in welcoming uh, Executive Director Eric Ward. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad to be here. Hello, everyone. Alyssa, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you so much, Eric, for making time. I know that in so many ways you are kind of at ground zero in all of the fights that we're uh, engaged in right now on human rights here in our country. So I really appreciate you taking the time out of that that schedule to uh, to talk with us. And it's just a pleasure. I've known you a long time and have always been such a huge fan and consider you kind of a guiding light in so much of, of what we've been trying to do. So I, 
it's a pleasure right. to, to be with you and have time to spend together. Thank you. And I know we have to get serious um, here, but I have to say, who says no to Georgetown Law? <laughs> no, no, and I was uh, so delighted. I was, of course, going to do anything you asked me to, to do, but um, it was, uh, and I was all excited. I, I think you remember, I was like, oh yeah, you know, I'd love to do something for Center for American Progress. But then you said, no, it's for, for Georgetown and you're gonna get a chance to talk to students. And I, I'm so there, I'm so delighted. I feel like I should be sending everyone listening right now, like compensation, you know, <laughs> I'm delighted to be on here. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, and I thought we would just start by, um, you know, by maybe hearing a little bit from you about Western State Center, because I yeah. think that it's an organization I know that I didn't know a lot about until you were there, um, but that has an interesting history. And, and, and then really just about your own journey into that work. And, and uh, I think you're from out west, so I'm, I'm curious to know kind of the pathway that brought you back, back west. Yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, Western State Center is often referred to as uh, one of the best kept secrets uh, out west. It's actually 30 years old, uh, 32 uh, specifically. And, you know, it was in or so let me say what it is first. So Western State Center is a nonprofit uh, organization that is committed to defending democracy and strengthening democracy by expanding racial and gender equity through public policy, right, through uh, culture and narrative. And that's how we do our work. We think that that is our role in making kind of a vibrant democracy. It's based in Portland, Oregon, and most of its on the ground work is in uh, the Pacific Northwest and uh, what we call kind of the inner mountain states. So uh, uh, Montana, uh, Wyoming, uh, Nevada, Utah, to, to name a few. So we are, uh, the easiest way to think of our geographic region is Idaho and every state that touches it. Uh, 30 years ago, why this does not seem to be, you know, now kind of an innovative groundbreaking idea Western State Center had this simple truth that uh, we could bring the human rights and equity voice from this region into national conversations by forging a relationship between grassroots organizations and activists, right? And those dealing with public policy, whether as, as elected officials, right? Or, or staff at, at the state and, and local level. And, that is what Western State Center did. Then as we were getting into that work early on, we figured out something that in the West, because of the demographics, there wasn't a large kind of diversity of organizations of color or women's organizations, LGBTQ organizations. So Western State Center took a step back and began investing in that grassroots base because there was no one yet for these uh, public policy leaders to, to meet and uh, try to co-create and, and support. So that has been Western State Center's work uh, for the last uh, 20 years. We focus on leadership development. So we hold a number of trainings and conferences from things such as how do you keep your books in a nonprofit to, to basic organizing, right? We support organizations by building relationships around um, uh, campaigns that improve racial and gender equity. Uh, we dabble a lot in culture, which we'll get to um, uh, narrative and culture, which we'll get to uh, later, right? Through music, working with um, uh, different types of artists. And then the fourth is, is we vigorously defend democracy, right? Um, Western State Center believes democracy is one of the most radical ideologies to have ever been created, right? Uh, and and uh, we work very hard, uh, we say in many ways, uh, at making democracy cool, uh, not just bureaucratic. And uh, that's Western State Center's work. And for me, listen, I did not grow up as an organizer, right? My, my parents were, uh, we went from uh, working poor to poor. That was like the, the evolution I grew up in, in 
uh, Los Angeles, California. I'm like three generations, I'm generation three of five generations of uh, black Los Angeleans. My family fled Kentucky, uh, uh, specifically Shepherdsville after uh, a, a lynching there of um, Marie Thompson, uh, who we just found out, uh, uh, I wrote about this recently, we just found out a few years uh, ago that she actually survived that lynching attack. Um, my family, my, my great great grand aunt moved my family out west and uh, I grew up in conservative Southern California in the Reagan era that was going through its own desegregation and that desegregation uh, of public schools, while I think uh, was vibrant, was also very traumatic and, and horrifying. Uh, most of my seventh, eighth, and ninth grades going back and forth to school, right, getting off the city bus and then walking that extra four or five blocks, meant being kind of inundated with folks driving by shouting out racial slurs, right, at a 12-year-old, right, a 13-year-old, a 14-year-old uh, young kid. And these weren't students, these were adults shouting, go back to Africa, calling me monkey, right? Revving their engines, everything they could do to terrify a young kid. It happened to me uh, and so many other black and Latino students in that era that we didn't even think about telling our parents or telling, like it never occurred to me to tell an adult that this was what it meant to go to school each and every day. As you can imagine, I spent uh, my uh, absentee rate was quite high right? I learned how to efficiently ditch school uh, in seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. Um, and uh, it made me realize as I grew up that I had a low tolerance for, for bullying and, and the idea that everyone didn't have a right. But what really changed my life, and then I'll end this because this is a long intro, is um, I grew up in the punk scene in, in um in LA, right, that meant punk, ska, reggae, that was my uh, reason to be, and it was early on in the scene, right, so this is like the, the 80s, right, 80, to, you know, 79 to 86, and eventually I became part of a band, right, the lead singer of this band that uh, went on to become known as Sublime, right, and so some folks may, may know that band, um, but that was kind of my growing up experience because while segregation brought some horrors, as I said, it also brought a lot of creativity. For a split second, it changed all the rules of the game, right? And uh, no one knew what to do around these rules. And so a bunch of us across different lines of race and religion and class, right, found each other through our love of music. And, uh, and it became a more powerful identity for a moment than our race and our religion, our gender, sexual orientation, right, identity, et cetera. That's how I grew up. But it was also 1980, Southern California. So it was in the midst of the, of the alleged war on drugs, which we all now know was a war on Black America, as has intention. We can hear the transcripts now. Um, you know, it was also true that crack, cocaine, and crystal meth were, were um, loose on the streets of Southern California. It was changing our friends in uh, substantial ways. There was no future for me. And um, I grew up thinking that I would not live to see 25, right? Um, I had two friends who were going to the University of Oregon. They invited me to, to move up with them. Five of us ended up moving up to Eugene, Oregon. My friends first asked me if I wanted to move to Eugene. Listen, I looked at them with the love a friend has for another. And um, I said, hell no, why would I ever leave LA and move to Eugene, Oregon, which I'm sure I pronounced Oregon, right? I just had no idea. And I thought, why would you ask me to, like, what did that look like? And the only thing I could think of in my mind looked like Little House in the Prairie, right? So if you could have looked in my brain, you would have seen San Francisco, a lot of trees, and the Space Needle, which isn't even in Oregon, right? But, in, but like in Seattle, Washington. I can say now with a lot of embarrassment, and I wasn't saying this to be mean, right, back in 1986, but I remember asking my friends, like, was there running water in Eugene? Was there electricity? Was there MTV? Now I just dated myself, right? <laughs> was there like McDonald's? Like, I just had no conception. And so I filled it with all of these myths and stereotypes that we do, right? 
when we don't have actual knowledge or, or experience. But I did a brave thing. I moved up anyway. Um, and um, I moved up at an era where the white nationalist movement was attempting to create an Aryan homeland in the Pacific Northwest. Now, it was never going to happen for lots of reasons, right? But there were murders and bombings and beatings that were happening, right? Law enforcement being fired upon by these white nationalists and then militia groups. So I um, did what I always did when I thought that bullies were around, which was to engage the community around how do we stay safe? How do we maintain our communities, right? So that they're thriving. And here in the Pacific Northwest, because of the scarcity of populations, right? The black population in uh, our region is probably less than 2% when you add it all together. In major cities like Portland, the black population is less than 4%, right? So we had to build coalitions, the same kind of coalitions that I had to build in my music scene. Right, we had to find other things that brought us together, and it was the the belief that democracy keeps us all safe. It is uh, it has been hard won, and uh, it helps us solve many of the problems that we face in society today. So I've been organizing ever since. Um, I still wake up in the morning thinking I can't believe that this is what I get to do every day. Um, and as you know, as an organizer, you also wake up each day saying, oh, my God, I can't believe this is what I have to do today. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So, so true. Um, so what uh, you went back, I, I think when we met, you were you were living in New York. Uh, you yeah. Were, you were working in philanthropy. Um, and uh, and then the next thing I heard, you were back out west. What? Uh, yeah. What, made you decide to do that and take on this challenge at Western State Center? Yeah, I am I'm a DIY kid, right? I'm a do-it-yourself. Uh, I'm a true punk rocker in, in that way. Uh, but we know we don't really do anything ourselves. So, you know, I organized um, for a group called uh, Community Alliance of Lane County in Oregon. Then I got hired as a regional coordinator, organizer, for a group called the Northwest Coalition Against Malicious Harassment. It was uh, founded by Catholic, a former Catholic priest uh, by the name of Bill Wasmuth. He is deceased now. He was from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And the Aryan Nations blew up his, par his, his parish home, right? They put a bomb outside of his window because he had been speaking against the, the Aryan Nations. And, you know, uh, uh, luckily um, for, for all of us, right? Uh, he happened, he was, he, you know, I like to point out, uh, I like to say this, he was a hippie priest, had an earring and, you know, everything which was very bold back then, right? And uh, he happened to be sitting in one of those beanbag chairs, right, on the phone talking to someone when the pipe bomb exploded. And so he, on the other side of the wall was the refrigerator that caught all the shrapnel. So he walked away, I'd like to say he walked away with no harm. He had permanent ear damage, and, um, uh, but, but he survived. And he was an incredible organizer. Um, he has an incredible uh, biography biography called Hate is My Neighbor, and I, I recommend it. But Bill Wasmuth hired this like punk rock kid, right, to, to, to organize. I guess he was also DIY. And um, I worked for, um, uh, from, uh, let's see, now I have to add, do the math from, uh, 1994 until uh, 2003, until the organization uh, died in, in transition. Um, but I worked all across the Pacific Northwest, primarily in rural communities with activists who were trying to build human rights infrastructure. Um, you know, I got to work with folks. It says I built 120. I heard on that resume, I did not build 120. I got to like encourage, right, the creation of over 120 human rights task forces across this region that fought for hate crimes and uh, against hate groups. Uh, eventually, I moved to Chicago and uh, for a job to work with the immigrant rights movement who was facing, as you know, uh, back in 2003, increasing uh, attacks from the anti-immigrant movement. Um, 
where many white nationalists had resided. So I worked at the Center for New Community from 2003 to 2010. And then a foundation asked me to come work for them, right? And I live, and when they uh, actually offered me the job, finally after interviews, I looked over my shoulder to see who were they talking to, right? Um, like, and so I got to work as a program executive at Atlantic Philanthropies. I oversaw saw the portfolio as a program officer uh, over immigrant rights, um, over national security and rights, right? Addressing uh, the the attack on the rights of Muslim Arabs and South Asians and also C4 electoral engagement, uh, particularly voter education uh, and turnout. Uh, Atlantic was a limited life foundation, meaning it was trying to spend all of its money out in closed doors. So I moved on, um, was hired. Then I thought, well, that's it in philanthropy. And then the Ford Foundation asked me to come work for them um, as a program officer overseeing its civil rights portfolio. Uh, and it was during that time that the presidential elections um, uh, 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 that Donald Trump decided to run um, under the Republican primaries uh, and then for the presidency. And this punk rocker had to make a decision, which was um, I felt I was one of the folks, as you know, who thought Donald Trump would win that election in, in 2017. And I had to ask myself, what did I wanna say I had done uh, during that period? And it was, not, uh, uh, it was not being involved in a strategic planning process as much as I love the Ford Foundation. As amazing as it, everyone was, I encourage everyone to go work at the Ford Foundation. It was a phenomenal experience but I needed to be back on the ground. And the place I could be closest on the ground was in the area that I had done organizing. And I knew the West, particularly Oregon, would be critically important to this national conversation. Uh, and there was a tragic murder that happened um, the April before I got here, uh, where a white nationalist uh, on a light rail uh, threatened uh, two young black women, one who was Muslim, clearly identifiable as Muslim. Uh, he was an individual who appeared, uh, had been prone to violence uh, before this. And, uh, and uh, three white men uh, stood up, they did not know each other, but they stood up and they put themselves between uh, this white nationalist and these two young women on the, the light rail and he was uh, so angry that he couldn't get to these young girls that he pulled out a knife and he cut the throats of all three of these men. Um, two of them died um, there on, on the light rail. And I have dealt with hate crimes long enough to know people don't intervene usually in hate crimes. They don't intervene in crimes. Um, most of us are standby. Uh, and the fact that none of them knew each other right, and, and did that uh, was quite a testament. The fact that they were white men who did this uh, was quite a testament. And I just knew um, that, uh, that, um, that that needed to be remembered and that that courage needed to be matched and uh, the serious of the moment. So I came back West uh, to Oregon. I've been back here now for uh, three years uh, based in Portland, Oregon and uh, with a very small uh, nonprofit uh, that punches above its weight class. Um, and it's, it's been really, uh, uh, it's been hard work, but it has been some of the most inspiring work that I've, I've ever participated in. Well, you were certainly prescient in, uh, in, in many ways in that arc of that story um, in terms of knowing where uh, the center of gravity was going to be for a lot of these issues in, in heading back uh, to Oregon. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of the, you know, for the generation of law students now, um, you know, seeing in the year 2020 open expressions of anti Semitism and white nationalism in our country seems so, so jarring. And yet, you know, when you when you think back 30 years, um, 
you know, we were looking at that through the prism of this Aryan nation and separatists and Timothy McVeigh and that, that kind of thing. But the roots of that, um, you know, obviously go way back. Um, you know, and when we see it today, it, you know, it's, it sometimes feels like, you know, we are locked in this historical dynamic in which, you know, the sin of racism is just endemic to our country. Um, it's just sometimes just feels so hopeless, like that it's who we are, um, or at least, you know, that we're regressing somehow as a nation when we see these eruptions and all of the, the these things that we, you know, thought were at, that were skeletons are now alive and walking around in the, you know, streets of, of so many uh, cities and small towns in our, in our country. Um, but we've also seen some progress and we know from history that progress on these issues in particular almost always produces some kind of backlash. So I'm just curious, you know, you, you've thought about this some, um, you know, are we in a period of regression or, or backlash? You know, those kind of require different sorts of strategies. One is a, is a little bit of more hopeful narrative in a way, however challenging. Um, the other, you know, and I think every day I, I sort of uh, toggle between these two, you know, hope and despair. Um, how do you see it? Yeah, I think this is a really good question. And I think, Alyssa, before we answer this, we have to give people one caveat, right, just so, so that they know, which is um, I spent from uh, 1991 uh, until 2002 attending white nationalist and far right meetings and, and gatherings uh, in the United States. So I, I, I don't say this um, from conjecture, right? I'm, I'm sharing a, a, a little bit about my thoughts and, and understandings um, of a movement that, uh, uh, that very few non-white nationalists, right, have, have had that much access to. Um, look, we, I, I, so, you know, I, I feel like there's, there's a thesis piece that I'll just throw out right away, which is um, there is not a regression going on in, in the United States. Um, there is a backlash and the, the backlash is, uh, you know, to be really clear in my belief is a backlash to the 1960s civil rights movement, right? Um, it is to the gains of, of the 1960s uh, civil rights movement. Now, as, as a social movement organizer, um, we have to, I have to say also, uh, to be accurate, it's not a 1960s civil rights movement, right? Uh, many of the significant gains of the 1960s civil rights movement actually occurred in the mid 1950s, whether we're talking about Little Rock, right? whether we're talking about uh, Rosa Parks and the Montgomery bus boycott, right? And when I talk to enough historians, and there may be some on here right now throwing things at the screen saying, but Eric, it was a 1940 civil rights movement, right? So movements um, don't actually work in the way that our mind works. Our mind looks for specific historical markers. And the truth is, is the, civil, the 1960s civil rights movement had a very long arc. And so too is the white nationalist movement. In, in short, I would just say, you know, let us understand this. The white nationalist movement comes about as a reaction of the defeat of white supremacy. And what I mean by that is that until the 1960s civil rights movement, right, white supremacy was the rule of law and is the most like, legalistic word I will use, term I will use right now, right, which is du jour, right? And uh, you all can probably train me on what that really means. But how we understand it on the organizing end is, is this, that it was uncontested. That is how we understood society uh, to be by law, by mores, by rules. Then along comes the civil rights movement, which doesn't wipe white supremacy off the map. Let's be clear this historic and present day of uh, uh, system of inequality that was formed on the genocide and, and stolen resources of native people, right? Chattel slavery of, of black people, 
right, and the control of sexuality, primarily women in society, is still with us. Um, but it's much more de facto, if we're going to ask which way it leans, it leans much more towards de facto than de jour each and every year, right? And, um, but if you were an ardent segregationist, you were taught, right, socialized to believe that Black people were inferior in every way, right? In every way. And so you wake up one morning and you find out the system of white supremacy is no longer the rule of law. How do you explain that folks you saw as inferior defeated you, right? The only way to do that is to come to a point where you say, well, black people aren't inferior, but that's unlikely how, how segregationists were going to respond to that. So instead they crafted another understanding of why they lost. If white supremacy, that system of discrimination was built off of the paper of racism, right? Particularly anti-black racism in America. This new theory was built off of the paper of anti-Semitism. And I wanna explain another form of racialized bigotry. So what happened is, is drawing, many of them of the segregationists were veterans who had fought in World War II. They were very familiar with uh, a book that had been highly distributed across Nazi Europe called The Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, right? And it was a fake uh, a document that had been created in the early 1900s by, uh, this sounds so familiar actually right now, this is, sounds uncanny, um, by secret police in Tsarist Russia because they were concerned about the spread of democracy in France. And this fake document uh, purported to tell the story of Jewish elders gathering in a cemetery at uh, midnight to plot the takeover and destruction of European Christendom. And it purported that Jews were seeking to take over the economy, right? Take over culture, right? All of these kinds of things. I think there's something like, you know, 30 something protocols. Well, the thing about this narrative, Alyssa, that I think is important is that it's a powerful narrative, right? And uh, the narrative continues to exist because it's a great story, even though it is a fake and anti-Semitic story. How powerful is that narrative? It's powerful enough that nearly every alien invasion film that has ever been created, right, is based off the narrative of the protocols of the elders of Zion. And my favorite example is the X-Files. Everyone kind of remembers the X-Files. It was the show way back in the days and in, in the nineties, right? That was about two FBI agents who were on the search for the truth. They believed that there was a secret invasion at work, right? To take over the world, to infect, right? To infect humans so that aliens could take control, right? And that only a few people knew it, right? And their job was to kind of alert the rest of the world and everybody else could be in on it, right? In on this conspiracy. It's, it's pretty much QAnon. QAnon is also a conspiracy that is based off the protocols of the elders of Zion, but you wouldn't know it if you don't know the protocols of the learned elders of Zion. So, for these World War II veterans, they've been exposed to it in that way. And they've been exposed to it because Henry Ford, um, who was an industrialist who invented the mass production of the automobile, was also a hardcore anti-Semite who came across the protocols and republished it in his newspaper, which he sold in Ford dealerships all across the country under the title, The International Jew. So it wasn't an idea that was unfamiliar, but it became a convenient answer. The answer became that they didn't lose to black people and that allowed them to maintain this idea of black people as inferior. And it allowed them then to create a new other, which was right the, the idea of the conspiratorial Jew who was devious, right? Who was seeking to destroy uh, white Christianity, right? The white population uh, in the United States. That's why now when you hear the word okay to be white, right? You can now know where that derives from, right? Or the idea of white genocide in the United States. These all derive from that narrative. 
so does QAnon's uh, narrative around trying to uncover a pedophile conspiracy uh, in America. That is no different than the accusations of ritualized murder, right? Um, and the abuse of, of children that was lodged against the Jewish community in the protocols of the elders of Zion. So here we have this backlash against the gains of the civil rights movement. But white nationalists position themselves differently than their former white supremacists, right? They form it by saying that their war is not about keeping black people or women or gays or immigrants or Muslims in their place. The goal under white nationalism is the destruction, right? They see themselves in an existential war with the Jewish community. And that those communities I just named are merely puppets of this larger war. That is why we saw these mass murders that occurred targeting uh, Latinos in a Walmart in El Paso, right? The targeting of black people in a church in Charleston, South Carolina the targeting of Sikhs in Wisconsin, or even the targeting of Jews in Poway or Pittsburgh. All of those, right, were driven by this anti-Semitic worldview. In all of those cases, while racism and Islamophobia, right, were in play, right, while hatred of Jews was in play, the overarching narrative of the killers was that they were in a war right, against the Jewish community. And it's why I argue that anti-Semitism is as much of a threat to non-Jews as it is Jews. But let me get to this piece. We see these murders, we see all of these things happen, and it's easy to feel that we're losing ground, right? But we're not losing ground, I promise folks. Each and every day, I see it in policy, I see it in discussion, I see it in culture, I see it in economy. And I'm not here to paint rainbows and, and unicorns. What I'm here to say is there is one fundamental truth in America that we can rely on, which is black folks, right, and others, right, but primarily black folks have struggled to build what democracy exists in America. Um, you know, uh, we think of like John Lewis who just passed away recently, who said, you know, once, before the 1960s civil rights movement, right? Democracy was merely an aspiration. And then he said, our movement made it real, right? And it has become more and more real each and every day. How do we know? Well, we can tell you, I can tell you quite honestly, 2020, right, is not like 1920. And, 19, and 2020 is certainly not like 1820 America. We have a long way to go. We get way too comfortable in the quest for real democracy. But Black folks have built democracy in America. What democracy exists has come primarily from Black organizing and those who have built off of it. Democracy that Black struggle has built has proved itself over and over to be advantageous to everyone, not just the Black community, right? And that's why I say, Democracy, right, still proves itself in America to be the most radical, right, ideology because it is built off of abundance, not off a scarcity model. It is the idea, right, that everyone, everyone, whether they are a 70 year old white veteran in rural Iowa facing employment discrimination or a 16 year old trans Latina facing job discrimination in New York City, that both of them and everyone in between has the right to live, love, worship, and work free from fear and bigotry. And that we are capable enough as people, right, to govern our own affairs within a societal structure. That is the, that is the audacity, right, of, of democracy. We don't need dictators. We don't need strong men or strong women, right? We don't need to solve problems by making more silos. We solve problems by bringing together the most creative, right, in our communities, the most vulnerable within our communities. And we open up space for democracy to do its job, right? And I feel 
um, uh, you know, I can tell you the story and I know I've been talking now a long time, but I'll tell you the story, Lisa. My partner and I, uh, uh, I don't know now, it feels like it was a year ago. So I'm sure it was like just three months ago, um, but it was in the height of the Black Lives Matters protest, right? And the murder of uh, George Floyd in, in Minneapolis. And, you know, I was a little, I'm in Portland, Oregon, right? So let's just say it, I, I know there's Portlandia, but I think everyone now understands Portlandia was a little bit hype, right? Now I think folks understand what Oregon looks like, what Portland looks like, what it means to be a person of color here each and every day, right? And uh, here we are uh, outside of the, you know, urban core of downtown uh, Portland. And, you know, we're up in the West Hills and, you know, I don't want to, uh, give folks a wrong impression of the West Hills, right? Uh, I, I'm just saying it's not the core of, of Portland, Oregon. And I, you know, my partner and I, she and I like saw this group of elementary school students, you know, there must have been like maybe one student of color in this group. These are elementary age school students marching down the street with their sh shouting Black Lives Matters, right? Um, on like in basically the suburbs of, of Portland, Oregon, right? And they were a mighty elementary age school grouping of, of voices. And you know what? You know their parents weren't going to let them go out there before. So their parents were like trailing them behind. And I'm sure not all their parents agreed, but every one of those parents, you could see the pride in their face, right? And those students had, those elementary age school students had something to say, right? They wanted people to know that Black Lives Matter and that it wasn't that big of a deal to say it. It was actually kind of exciting. And when we came down later, right, they had taken all their signs and they had put it on the chain link fence, right, on the highway, all of, all of their signs that they had created and, and had left it as, as a memorial. And, you know, um, my partner and I were talking and we were just like, you know what? I think we've won, right? And this, we have to remember that right now. We, we have a group of folks in our society who are afraid of the future, right? And who have keep telling us, and this is about the stories we tell ourselves. You know, we keep telling ourselves that the future is down the road, that it's someday, that it's coming, that we got to work for the future, right? Well, this guy who has been organizing now for, uh, over 30 years is here to tell you for whatever it's worth, right? The guy who called the rise of white nationalism, who called the rise of Donald Trump, I'm here to tell you the future is actually here. We're in it, right? And uh, I don't know what we were asking for, but we got it. And we should turn our attention, right? To this moment, not the folks who are trying to drag us back to a past that we can't even get to, right? and who are throwing tantrums on, on the streets of, of DC, as we saw this weekend, they couldn't even get 15,000 people out there with a week, right? With a week long planning, right? With resources, I saw how much money, right? That defense committee has raised, right? They could not get more than 15,000. When I say 15,000, I'm including counter protesters in the media, right? They likely had less than 10,000 people, and they are saying the elections were stolen, right? And that is all they could galvanize. We should not believe the hype, right? There is, um, uh, uh, there is no oxygen there except threats and intimidation of violence, right? This is, right, the multiracial inclusive democracy right, that we have all said is possible. And our job is to dream the dreams that make that possibility a reality. We owe that to every person who has come before us, who's given up their lives, right, who has been beaten, who has been ostracized, who has been isolated, right? We owe it to those folks. And finally, Alyssa, we, we owe it to the generation that comes before us. I think of the daughter of George Floyd, right? She is a young girl who never gets her father back, right? Her father never gets to see her graduate. He never gets to take her on that first date with her partner. He never gets to teach her how to play sports. She never gets her father back. And I saw her in the midst of this protest, 
on the shoulders of um, a family member or family friend, thousands of people, she's a young girl. And I saw her just looking around at everyone, folks who had her father's name, right? Chanting his name, chanting Black Lives Matter, thousands of people. And I heard her say on this video, my daddy changed the world, you know? And I think about that. And I think, you know what? Her daddy did change the world. And it wasn't his responsibility and it wasn't his burden, right? But it's what happened. And that little girl deserves that changed world. And so do all those kids who were marching up the street, right? All those white kids who were marching up the street with their Black Lives Matter sign, they deserve that world, but they don't get it unless we start acting like we are in that world right now. And that's why I think this is not a regression. This is a backlash that we can manage if we choose to manage it. Yeah, yeah, that's, it's, that's an amazing overview and a really hopeful framing of, of where we are at this moment, Eric. I think, you know, you referred in that, in that piece where you told that story, which I hope everybody will take a look at on, on Medium, uh, uh, to winning the peace. Winning the peace. And it is, uh, and to, you know, kind of basically buy time for the next generation coming up um, to do their work and kind of put their oar in uh, to get us, you know, over the next set of rapids. Um, and those things require different kinds of strategies. You know, when you're trying to win the war, you're, you're doing uh, one set of strategies. When you're trying to win the peace, that uh, you know, requires a different set of skills and a different uh, set of strategies. And I wanted to ask you, uh, we're going to turn to everybody's questions in about, you know, five or 10 minutes. But, um, but you know, I teach this class here at Georgetown on uh, effective human rights advocacy in polarized environments. And, and we talk a lot there about, you know, disrupt, disrupting expectations um, of, of people who want to put you know, the other in a, in a particular box and how do you get out of that and have, you know, authentic conversations with people, sometimes even in your own family, uh, yeah. these things are going on. And so I wondered if you could talk about a little bit about that. I also um, was, you know, there's a lot of talk now that, that Biden um, has won about the need for unity and reaching out and seeking unity and you know, understandably, a lot of people say no thanks to that. You know, unity is maybe some long-term goal that we want, um, but not, you know, we're not looking to compromise with the folks chanting Jews will not replace us. You know, that's not, we're not gonna find some middle ground necessarily. And it strikes me, and this is something we talk a lot about in class, that you know the skills of persuasion and engagement and and all of that are are really they're both the thing we need the most right now, and they're the thing that is hardest right now. How how do we approach that, and how should you know young people who are about to you know kind of step into this world uh, to take up the you know the mantle that. Uh, you and others have have carried. How should they approach that? What skills do they need? Yeah. So, I I think it's it's um, it's it's important uh, to hold the following skills. So, the the first is is humility, right? Um, you cannot start off a conversation with someone and hope to build a relationship by starting off the conversation uh, by telling them they're wrong, right? Um, or uh, telling them that they are a bigot or, or, or racist, right? Um, I don't know any conversation where that has then ended up well, right? So we, we do, you know, so we have to ask questions. The first thing is we have to start with humility and we have to ask the question in a, a different way. Uh, the way we ask the question is, tell me more about why you think that, right? And we have to have the patience to then follow that up with at least four other why questions, right? And they have to be not trick questions. They're not got your questions. 
you actually have to be humble enough to want to know the answers to that. And uh, that's how I tell folks, that is the way you can measure right away whether you really wanna have that conversation and you wanna do that work with that person. If you don't have the patience to ask those five whys, you actually shouldn't spend your time telling that person you're they're wrong, right? It's a, it's a waste of energy. So that's the first. The second, I think, is we have to understand, uh, we, we have to, to be more realistic about the diversity of ideas in America. I've read some studies, um, uh, I think one's called Hidden, Hidden Tribes of, of America, I think is the name of it. Um, I don't know if I like the tribes part, but you know, it's, it's the, that's not the point. It, it's a actually really good study um, and I actually think it's an honest study because it's actually not looking to prove a point, except that America is much more politically diverse than we think, and we are not the majority, right? Um, the folks, you know, who are saying Jews will not replace us, who are marching on the streets with, with guns and weapons, right? Uh, and then those who support them uh, are about 11% of the population, right? In contrast, right? The folks we would call us, the human rights folks and like our supporters, we are like around 8% of the population, right? We spend most of our time, we spend most of our resources and time beating up on the liberals just to the right of us, right? That's where we engage most of our time. And that 11% of the far right spends most of their time not beating up on the other like uh, percentage that's just adjacent to them. They spend most of their time trying to, to organize them, right? And trying to dominate that coalition, right? So, so we approach it in, in, a, in a different way um, that I think is not a strategy that gets us to where we're going. My goal in life is not, I didn't sign up to do social change work to spend my time beating up on um, political opponents. I signed up because I want a better world and a stronger democracy. Right. And and so we, we, we have to to really think about tactics the, and, and we have to understand where we are. We have to have an honest assessment of how much power we actually bring. Right. And moral power is just one form of power. Right. And um, it's not the most effective form of power right now. And so telling folks they're wrong, wrong, wrong. I, I mean, it makes us feel good, but it doesn't help us. And I think about uh, um, Amy Cooper in Central Park. This is the one I like to yeah. um, um, uh, mess with people with. You know, so we know Amy Cooper. Amy Cooper did a horrifying thing, which is uh, she threatened, uh, and I think she then did, called the police on an African-American man simply because, right, she felt it was insulting that he asked her to leash her dog in a leash part of the park, right? and she put him in jeopardy. So I'm in no way taking away. I, um, as a person who has who's dealt with police brutality, including as a program officer at the Ford Foundation, right? I, I, get, I get more than anyone uh, the, the danger of that. So look, we yelled at, we yelled at Amy, right? We, 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 uh, uh, we went after her on social media, the media went after her. She lost her dog, she lost her, do or, or, her job, you know? Um, look, she, she got her dog back. She'll have a new job. So I, it's not like I'm sitting here thinking like, you know, her life wasn't destroyed. I, I reject that. Um, but she was called out and there was a lot of energy. But I like to be clear, right? Nearly now, eight, nine months. I don't know now. We're almost a year after that. Nothing has changed tangibly for Black America. I mean, everyone got to feel very self-righteous that they got to identify a racist and, and call out that racist. But nothing changed. And my argument was Amy Cooper was never the real problem, right? Uh, look, I don't like Amy Cooper for doing that. And, you know, if we were having beers, I'd probably be using other language to describe what I think of, of Amy Cooper's behavior, right? But it's, it's the, it was the behavior that was the problem. And the fact that she knew that institutions and systems would back her up. That was the real problem. And we spent no time talking about why did Amy Cooper feel like she would get a response to that, right? And that's the kind of new shift that's called for, right? 
you can't defend democracy, right? You can't defend the importance of democratic practice, i.e. governance, or e.g. governance, someone will tell me, right? Unless you actually believe in democracy, right? So the third thing is we have to stop with our own cynicism, right? This idea like we tear democracy down more than our opposition, right? We, we make light of what people gave their lives, right, to give to us as if it is no big deal. Well, let's be clear, governance, right, is what makes democracy work, right? Understanding institutions and institution, um, and how they, how they function is what makes democracy work. It is not just about marching on the streets and being arrested, but look, you know, I'm down for that too. I'm just saying there are whole other areas of work that need to be attended to in this garden called democracy that we have kind of shirked off or have put off as not being important or being like the job of bureaucrats, right? Rather than what an opportunity to leave a stronger democracy, right? For those who follow after us. And what an amazing struggle it is. Look at this election cycle. People have never felt so alive. Look, scared, freaked out, I'll, I'll give you that. But folks have never felt so bonded, right? To their society, to their communities uh, and to each other. And that calls for hard conversations, right? You can't govern a country with only 8% of the population. Yeah, yeah. So that's, um, that. I think that's really helpful at the macro level and all the way down to the micro level. Yeah. You know, that we have to think about, you know, what are we really trying to accomplish? Um, yeah. and, and is what we're doing a smart strategy to get there? Um, uh, okay, I think that we wanna, I don't know, Melissa, if there's a queue with questions already. I have a whole bunch that I haven't asked her yet, but I think uh, to be fair, we should bring in uh, the, you know, 40 some odd people that we've got here. Oh, wow. Uh, to hear what we're gonna talk about. Yeah, there's a couple questions that have come in through the queue and I invite anyone to add your questions. Um, I'm going to, ask the first question that's come in, but sort of add my own flavor to it as well, take it the privilege of the moderator and, and add some, some of my own question. Um, you know, I think, I think we're all at this moment having just gone through a very bruising political battle for um, this election and looking at the outcome of the presidency. And I think for those of us who are human rights advocates and on the left, I think there was this sigh of relief, at least a momentary sigh of relief on, mm -hmm. on that Saturday when, um, when Biden was announced the president. But I think like, I think there's also been some honest reflection on what the election results show about our country when we're, it's, we're so very clearly divided. Um, and I was really glad that you talked about sort of like the percentage portion of the population that are in these extremist movements. You know, it's only 11% of the population that might identify in that way, but also we're, we're on our own extreme um, as human rights advocates. And I think, you know, a thing that my students are struggling with and a lot of people are struggling with and this first questioner is asking, you know, how do I, how do I engage in, with a Trump supporter um, when my work is to advocate for LGBTQI asylum seekers and refugees? How do I move past um, the resentment of the past four years? And one of the things I'm sort of wondering as well is, you know, in, in my own conversations with, within my own family, um, I think there's a segment of, of the population that, um, that supports our current president, President Trump, um, that doesn't identify with these extremist movements at all. Um, and also has a hard time even understanding how a vote for one administration might be a vote towards policies that hurt people of color and hurt our diverse population and hurt refugees. And so I think, you know, how do we have a conversation with people without labeling them in the extreme and recognizing that we might be in our own, our own bubble on, on the other side um, and looking at people in that way? So that's, that's the first question and we'll get to the others as they come in. 
It's a great question. So here's here's what I would would offer up right uh, around this. Um, the first thing we 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 should remember is people join uh, movements and um, uh, for all kinds of reasons, right? Now, um, and I want to go back to the X Files and anti-Semitism as a, as an example of this, right? There are all kinds of folks who watch alien invasion films, right? I'm a big fan, right, of, of alien invasion films. Um, uh, a lot of folks I know are, right? No one would come up to me and say, Eric, right? Um, you are involved in kind of an anti-Semitic uh, subculture, right? Like that no one would start that conversation with me. One is because I wouldn't know what you were talking. I mean, I would, but most people wouldn't even know what you're talking about. And, um, and it would be hard if you came up to me and said, Eric, you're anti-Semitic because you uh, love Independence Day, right? That's just not how we would start off a conversation. But we start off that conversation with Trump supporters all the time that way, right? And I can just tell you, I mean, if you've ever had an argument at home or with a best friend, right, starting off a conversation that way, whether it's political or even if it's about who's supposed to buy the bread, right, it does not end, it just doesn't end well. So I get, look, <laughs> you're talking to a, a, a black man who lives in the Pacific Northwest, right? Who grew up in Los Angeles, California, right? In the midst of the drug wars and the, you know, weed and seed, right? And um, who has engaged with the white nationalist movement. I've watched folks come out of the white nationalist movement. I have watched folks go into the white nationalist movement and everything around it, right? And so I say this with all, all seriousness. Um, we can't start conversations that way, even if it feels totally justified, because it doesn't work. And we, I don't spend my time to do things that are ineffective. And I don't think anyone on here um, is trying to waste an hour in their day. I don't know what it's like to go, go to Georgetown as a student, but I bet it's busy. And, um, you know, I've been on that campus. I know folks who have gone to school. So I just say, no one, we are not about wasting our time. And I hate to say it, right? So this is, you know, and I say this to a person, I am, I'm a, you know, let's be clear. Eric is a radical leftist, right? I'll say that right now. Um, I have never hidden, you know, my ideology. What I'm saying is my ideology isn't as important as my values, right? My ideology is just my ideology. And we have made ideology everything in our conversations at the expense of values. So the second thing I would just recommend is don't start a conversation based off of ideology. If you're looking to kind of move people forward, start by trying to figure out what values you have in common, right? And once you understand what values you have in common, you are gonna be able to make an assessment around whether you can do work with that person or that organization or that institution. Stop basing it off of whether you see someone as conservative, right? Or liberal or Democrat or Republican or left, right, right? And start trying to figure out what are the values that we have in common? And do we have enough values in common that lead us towards inclusion, right? rather than exclusion. So, and then the last thing I would just say, right, is um, when you have those conversations with folks, um, keep in mind, right, that we are the ones who are supposed to be the adults. We are the ones who say that we are the rational side. We are the ones who say that we know how to govern society in a way that benefits everyone, right? If that's the case, this is less about our own personal feelings and what we're experiencing. And it is about our leadership, right? In constructing that rainbow nation that I think all of us want, right? All of us want safety. All of us want opportunity. All of us want the idea that life is better, right? For the generation that comes after us. 
there are so many values we have in common. I'm saying all the students here and, and any faculty who are listening, I can just say this one value that I have in common right now with Georgetown, not knowing any of you, is that we all like to work hard. I know you all like to work hard because even if you say you don't like to work hard, I know you like to work hard because we have that in common. Start the conversation with the things we have in common. Our political ideologies don't bring us together. And our job as the radical left, right, is to um, remember, you don't make peace with our friends. We make peace with our enemies. Thank you so much for that thoughtful answer. Um, we've had a couple of questions come in and some touch on similar themes. So I'm, I'm gonna do another bit of combining. Um, you know, you've done such a good job in some, some of your writing in outlining action steps for movements and like things that people can concretely do. Um, some, of, some of the students have asked what what do you see of the role of lawyers within these movements? Or um, what do you see of the role of organized labor in the human rights and anti-racism movements? And once you see their roles, how do you get involved? Um, where is the work where people are having these conversations? Um, is it distinctly human rights? Is it organizing? Um, and finally, just to tack onto that, a lot of people look at these um, opportunities as being exclusively within the New York and DC regions like can you speak more about where you know where can you get involved in the more local level and where are some of this exciting grassroots movements happening oh I like this. this is a good question here's what I would say um um around this I would say um are lawyers needed um how much time do we have I, I want to see how succinct I need to be versus can I tell a story? We've got 20 uh, minutes left and a couple oh, more questions. So tell your story. We, I'm going to tell my story. This is great. Um, and folks, bear with me. If you haven't noticed anything, I'm a storyteller. So uh, we had a situation this summer in uh, Portland, Oregon. So like the rest of the country, we were having um, large mobilizations um, in response to police brutality and the police shooting of um, unarmed individuals, particularly unarmed black individuals, um, you know, and it revolved around, as I said, you know, um, the the killing of George Floyd. Now, I don't call if you noticed, and and I should say this, you don't hear me call it a murder, and I should explain why um, for those who are listening. I don't call it a murder because I want to to um, really reinforce for folks that it wasn't actually illegal, right? That um, the laws in this country protect the disproportionate killing, right? Of, of black people, that, that is the law uh, right now. Um, and it is uh, horrifying and it, and it needs to change. Um, but I feel like it's important for us to call it exactly what it was. In Portland, folks read the news um, we had a riot on the first night, and I'm going to call it that, what it was uh, on the first night. Um, and in subsequent nights, uh, there was limited property destruction. And unlike the news, which made everyone think all of Portland was on fire, right, this was about two square blocks of downtown Portland, Oregon. And to be honest, it was just like two long blocks of Portland, Oregon. Uh, and it was where the Federal Justice Center um, uh, sat and that there within that was a small group that kept attempting to vandalize that and other places around the city. I'm not here to defend uh, property destruction. I am here to say I don't equate it to the loss of human life, right? Um, and uh, it in no way equates with the loss of, of human life, but neither am I going to pretend that property destruction has no impact on people either, right? Um, I'm, a, I'm a proponent of nonviolent civil disobedience, nonviolent mass mobilization. That is where I stand. Uh, there was property destruction. I think it was unneeded. I get folks were angry. There's not a lot of organization on the streets. Uh, but in comparison to things like Mardi Gras or after the Super Bowl or concerts, uh, there was a very small level of, of violence. And so that needs to be said. Well, 
things start to die down. And then we have the federal government all of a sudden shows up under DHS, Chad Wolf, right? Who uh, at that point, the courts have now ruled wasn't even the legal, you know, even temporary director of DHS. Um, and he put this configuration of federal enforcement on our streets under kind of like a quasi, what I call a quasi paramilitary formation, right? And these folks were not trained in crowd control. And what we were hearing from other voices inside of government and from media was that these were some of the most like hardcore folks out of DHS, right? And, um, and we were concerned. So um, we could not put people out on the streets at Western State Center. Uh, and you know, our job is to remind folks we're actually winning the peace, right? That we're not at war. And we were unable to do that because this new entity came into play. Well, on its very first night, it there was an individual who was on the streets who had a, um, a big radio over his head. And this paramilitary force uh, uh, run by DHS fired a CS canister into his head and crushed his skull, right? And we started to receive reports of individuals who were being snatched off the streets, right? In unmarked vans, put in hoods and interrogated. And you're all wondering, what does this have to do with lawyers, right? And I'm just like, I cannot believe what is going on, right? And I immediately believe that this is a test run for what is intended in any kind of post-election controversy. I didn't know what to do, right? We either had to put more people on the streets or we had to figure out something else. Well, I was lucky enough to have strong relationships with some lawyers. And I had a lawyer who I talked to about this, who said, I have, a, let me ask you some questions. And I answered the questions. And he said, it sounds like you are arguing that there is a violation of the 10th Amendment states rights clause. And the First Amendment, that your First Amendment, freedom of speech, right? Freedom of assembly as Western state center, right? Is being denied. And we found other individuals who believe the same, Unitarian Universalists, state elected officials, right? A, um, and we took DHS to court. And we took in the Ninth Circuit, do I need to say anyone after I say Ninth Circuit? We, we took folks to court in the Ninth Circuit. Look, we got a very conservative judge. So I wanna blow this left right thing again. And we got a very conservative judge who filed an immediate injunction, right? And, and he said, it looks like you all have a really strong case. And that filing of the injunction, the filing of the suit itself was enough to chill DHS and to get them all to pull back to actual federal property. Well, they tried to appeal the injunction. It went to a three member panel. See, I feel like I can actually say this now in the ninth district, right? One judge appointed by Trump, two by Bush, right? and they refuse to undo the injunction, right? And so do lawyers matter? Absolutely. <laughs> if you're asking me, absolutely. Because in July, I saw one of the most horrifying things I have ever experienced in my life, right? In terms of its potential. And it was the legal community that protected us, right? That helped us understand, um, what, the, what this meant and, and how to pursue it. So yes, and then I think of Thurgood Marshall, right? I don't know if folks have read the book by King Devil in the Grove. Um, I really highly recommend it. Um, it is the story of Thurgood Marshall, right? And I didn't realize until I read that book that we almost didn't have Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, that he was almost lynched, right? He escaped with his life out of Florida. Um, and he would have been killed um, or deeply injured, right? But I also read about the lawyers of that era who basically built new precedent. There was no, there was no civil rights law, right? There was no civil rights law. And I think right now in the United States, there is very little human rights law that is accessible, 
right, at the local and state level in a meaningful way. And that is likely going to be built case by case um, by lawyers. So my sense is absolutely, absolutely lawyers who actually practice law, right, are, are, are needed. Um, don't let anyone think, right, that the things you all do, because it takes a level of discipline, right, and, and focus and unfolding, isn't as critical as when law enforcement had to carry me off on a truncheon, right? Both of those are equally important. And in fact, I'm gonna argue with all of you right now, governance is way more important than me getting carried off on a truncheon because governance, right? Ensures I don't get carried off on a truncheon pole by six law enforcement officers, right? Around the idea of simply just trying to exist, right? And so um, please, please um, not only complete your studies, but practice the law, right? Help us all to understand it in a way that doesn't make it sound magical, but as tangible as this lawyer did for me, uh, just say his name, Cliff Davidson, right? Uh, did for us in, in this moment. And I would just add to that, Melissa, that, um you know, students of human rights are familiar with Eleanor Roosevelt's uh, um, comments about where, after all, do human rights begin? In small places close to home. Yes. So you do not have to be in Washington or New York. Um, every, you know, and, and Eric, uh, at Georgetown Law, the motto is, uh, law is the means, but justice is the end. Mm. And so, you know, as lawyers, you have the incredible privilege of being trained to use the law to achieve justice. That is what you bring to the table. And, right. uh, and the tables that need that are everywhere, everywhere. Um, That's right. Uh, there's a, let's just say, rich opportunity <laughs> for you to use those skills wherever you are. That's right. And for local, if you're looking, you know, I know it can be hard outside, like I, I, again, right, it's been a long time since I graced the halls of, of campus, right? Um, I don't know what it's like to go to school, you know, these days, I don't know what the workload is like, I don't know what it's like to have to, to clerk and intern, like all of these things are unfamiliar, as unfamiliar to me as Oregon was. So I'm assuming it's much more complex than it is in my head. But I, but I will say this, one of the ways you can do this is just volunteer, like reach out to a local organization. It doesn't even really matter the size, it just matters that you believe in the work that they're doing. And you're gonna approach them and you're gonna say, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer, I'm a, I'm a law student. And they're gonna say, well, we don't know what to do with that, right? Our budget's like $30,000, we, we couldn't even file a, a case. But if you love the organization, just say to them, can I just sit and listen and, and let me just brainstorm what kind of legal remedies could we be exploring, right? Um, or, you know, that's why I think kind of the, the clinics are so critically important, right? Those moments where law students can come together and it doesn't have to be, if I could just say, listen, it doesn't just have to be like the big things, right? The, like the suing DHS, that's really big. Right? It could just be helping folks review like their personnel policies. And like, you, you can't imagine, you all are taught to think about the world and to see the world in a way that is hard for the rest of us. And I can only tell you, except when lawyers have said, I can't do anything, right? That I can't do something that I wanna do, right? Uh, I don't usually uh, have any bad feelings about lawyers being around. And I think you would find that uh, in, in, in this movement uh, and in the human rights space right now. I really, really think you will. And if you can't find that place, you know, tell Alyssa to put you all in touch with us because I'll, I'll try to figure it out. I'll, I'll try to figure out something to catch your attention. Thank you so much. I don't know how many questions do we have left? Because I have- That's right. 
yeah, there's one, there's one more question I think we'll end with, but I just wanted to thank you both for reinforcing the idea that human rights work is local. You know, human rights work can be protecting the right to water in Flint, Flint, Michigan. Human rights work can be assisting individuals who are experiencing homelessness in your own community. There's just so much work to be done on the ground. And particularly now when we're all sort of sheltering in place in one way or another, it's, such a ripe time to get involved locally. Um, and then I just wanted to do a small plug for another Georgetown Institute that is doing some of the work to assist in the examples that you gave, Eric. Um, the Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection has great resources, a toolkit to prevent violence and protests at violence at protests and rallies, and also a fact sheet on unlawful militias um, with state by state guides to the laws. So there's so many things that lawyers can do to provide resources and information to communities um, as we're confronting these um, issues in a polarized time. Um, so for our last question, I think it's a question on everybody's mind. I think part of the reason that we're um, seeing such a divided um, narrative and way that we're approaching conversations in our country right now is that we don't, we're not operating from a common sense set of facts and understandings. And I think one of the questions that came to us is how do you engage with these conversations with someone, you know, your suggestion about engaging in common values is such a good one. But when you try to bring facts into it about how to, how to achieve those values and those objectives, a lot of times it could be someone has a completely different understanding about what the truth is and what reality is, or might bring charges of, oh, that's fake news. So, so how do we engage in these conversations where we're trying to build commonalities and build bridges when our sense of understanding is so different? Yeah, this is, um, so there are spaces, right, where folks kind of sit across ideological or religious differences or racial differences and, and, and uh, engage in relationship strengthening, right? What, what, what I would say, I, I wanna re, I wanna propose something else that, that I think we, we start doing that's actually not that. That we start identifying things that need to get done and accomplished, right? And that instead of spending our time, so let, let's, let's be clear, I, I, folks say all the time, well, Eric, you're trying to pretend like you have conservative values or that you're down with, with uh, um, uh, supporters, you know, folks who might have supported Trump Right. But but you're not you're, you're just this leftist. Right. And it's, it's just rhetoric. And um, my sense is I tell folks that you're thinking about this in a wrong way. I am never going. Look, I'm never going to be a conservative. Right. Um, and um, I just never that's not where I'm going to be. Right. Um, and I'm not trying to reach over to that. What I'm trying to do is to reach in the center. Right. I am committed to reconstructing a center in this country. And I am completely willing to lean into the center. But for that to work, I need other folks to lean into the center too, right? Not become me, right? Not try to make me them, right? But to lean into the center because in the center is where all of us become influenced and changed, right? We can't have a conversation that doesn't influence us equally um, in powerful ways. So I think the way that we start constructing that center and encouraging people to be courageous enough to lean in is by identifying the things that need to get done. And I think, Melissa, you just landed on those, right? Unemployment. There are currently now somewhere around, uh, I, I believe, somewhere around 31 million Americans out of work, right? Not all actively looking for work, but there is like 31 million people were un, um, unemployed. There are um, over 250,000, but you know, there are so many people who have died from COVID, right? The, the COVID rates. And to make that real really quick, I, I should say, according to APM, um, uh, which is a research uh, a reporting company, they are saying that now one out of every 875 black people right, has died from COVID-19 in the last eight months. And I'm gonna say that again, one out of 
every 875 Black people has now passed from COVID-19 in just eight months, right? Imagine if we were talking about that in under any other cause, right? We would call that alarming. So when you think about those things, when you think about political violence, right? When you think about the fact, you know, I'm actually really excited to finally see my Republican uh, sisters and brothers and, and non-binary folks, right? Uh, acknowledge that the voting system in this country is frustrating. Frustrating. I find it frustrating too, right? I can't believe we live in a democracy with so many resources and it takes like a week to understand what the elections are, right? So I would be happy to sit down and to work with them, right? On the voting, on the VRA, right? And it's strengthening like, elect who doesn't want stronger elections in this country, right? So there are things we can work on in common. We just have to be serious about it, right? Um, and I think we're at a place where we say we're serious about moving forward, but what we really are serious about is just everyone believing what we believe, right? That's too fundamentalist for me. That's too purist uh, for me. I don't run a cult, right? I'm trying to move human rights. Can I just ask one last question, Eric? Because this is- Yeah, I know. This has been such a, a, just such a positive and hopeful and practically useful uh, conversation. And you just exude uh, so much positivity and energy. And I just, you know, want to know, like, what's your secret? Um, you, you know, <laughs> this work can be really frustrating and at times kind of demoralizing. And you know, everybody needs to fill the tank somehow. And, and I just wonder, how do you do that? Yeah, so I'll give you three quick reasons because uh, Alyssa, as you know, four years ago, I was saying um, the left and, and racial justice activists, we need to have a discussion and debate on anti-Semitism, right, four years ago. I said, white nationalism is a threat in America that we need to take seriously. And the third thing I said, um, now I'm forgetting like the, the, the third thing I said, which is we got to stop apologizing for democracy. We got to stop treating democracy, right? Like uh, 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 talking about it, like we're, we're, we just said the word fascism, right? And, uh, you know, as you know, lots of folks rolled their eyes and they said this is a distraction, it's not the real, real thing. But here we are, uh, last week, everybody was talking about it, right? And um, I wasn't forcing folks to talk about, I've never seen so many folks on the left talk about democracy and democratic practice before. The president, you know, Joe Biden, the president elect said the reason he ran, right, was because of the events of Charlottesville. He didn't shy away from talking about white nationalism, this election cycle. Um, and, you know, anti-Semitism is being discussed on, on the left. So I'm feeling pretty good because I feel like I have agency, but I want to tell everybody else, I am not special, right? I am no superhero, right? I'm, I'm a guy who likes to play a six string guitar, right? And stare at the grass growing in my backyard. That is my, that is my perfect place, right? That's my nirvana, right? Sitting at a bar, drinking Pat's Blue Ribbon, right? Watching like a folk singer or, the spoken word artist, right? That that's me. I want a marathon like like P Valley or something, right? That's that's where you find me naturally. I am not special. The only thing that makes me sound so joyful is the fact that I actually know we're winning, right? And I believe it. And I, I get to see it every day. And folks who know that they are winning, right, don't act like they're losing. It just, it's just is it, and there's nothing around us, right? I'm not saying it's not a 30 minute sitcom, right? So it doesn't get tied up all neatly in 30 minutes and everyone's all happy, you know, like happy days, right? Or whatever sitcom we watch, right? This is like real life. This is, this is real democracy. Um, but you know what? We're making the case. More white people today in the United States, right? The United States to get more white people in the United States today are supportive of Black Lives Matter than were ever supportive of Martin Luther King Jr. in his entire lifetime, right? More supportive of, of the protest, right? And marches that were taking around 
from the country than they were of SNCC, right? So I, I don't know. I was just on a call last week where uh, 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 a trans elected official uh, who is a black woman, you know, said, look, I openly embraced my whole life 10 years ago, right? And if you had asked me 10 years before that, that that would be possible in this society, I would have told you no way. And, I, and so would have all my friends. That's what she said on this panel, right? Her life has fundamentally changed. And again, not rainbows and unicorns. We got a long way to go, right? But the going is in the future where we are now, not the past that we've already departed. The past is depressing, right? You, you sit and you think about things you could have done or should have done or, or would have done. The future is about what do we build now? And this generation that has come up now, who built like the largest civil rights movement, which we all know civil rights is also another name for human rights, right? That we've ever will witness, right? In the modern era, right? It's, it was a massive mobilization. How could we not be excited about that? How could I not feel joyful? I, I don't know. I, it feels good to be winning. <laughs> it feels good. That is a really great way to wrap this up. I just want to uh, thank all of you for joining us and for your thoughtful questions. Uh, thank you, Andy and Melissa and Eric. Just thank, thank you, you for being with us and, and sharing with us and for everything that you do. Really. Such a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks Anytime. Take care. Thank everyone. you, everyone. Be well. Yes, thank you Bye. so much. Thanks for joining.